a long gospel today. <laughs> but I want to talk about just a few things, otherwise we'll be here all day. Today's gospel is about reacquainting ourselves with the scope and expectations of discipleship. It's easy to get caught up in all the rules about what ministry is and isn't, who's qualified for what thing. Oh, sorry. There we go. There we go. <laughs> uh, and what sorts of equipment we need to accomplish the tasks at hand and whatnot. With 2,000 years of practicing this faith of ours, it's easy to get overwhelmed with all the best practices and the standards and the expectations we've built up over the years. There's a dizzying array of ways that we can do the work that Jesus calls us to do. Thankfully, today, Jesus smooths it all out for us. He, through the perspective of the gospel writer Matthew, simplifies what it means to be a follower of the way. Matthew sets the tone of this pericope by telling us that Jesus begins, as he always does, with compassion. Jesus loves his people and cares deeply when they are, as Matthew describes, harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus starts his teaching by saying, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. First and foremost, there is abundance. This harvest provides us with more than enough to meet our needs. And Jesus understands the vastness of the needs of the world. Personally, I feel comforted by Jesus's acknowledgement of the scope of the mission field compared to the number of people who are enjoying it and taking advantage of it. His point, I believe, is to convey to all of us out here that keeping perspective is really important. Our efforts do not go unseen by God. Jesus says, therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. In other words, try not to be too overwhelmed at the vastness of God's creation. Invite others to be part of the way that we interact with it all. Ask for help when you need it. Oh, how many times <laughs> have we all found ourselves in a state because we didn't ask for help when we needed it. I'm not even gonna ask for a show of hands. <laughs> even before Jesus' hearers, all harassed and helpless as they are, even before they can complain about the workload, Jesus says, ask for help. A few people, well-trained and motivated, can accomplish quite a lot, but many hands make light work. Light work means we can spend better time building relationships with our fellow workers. Building these relationships resonates with the abundance of God's dream for humanity, for gathering the beloved community together. Matthew tells us that there was quite a lot of help to accomplish the work Jesus came to do. Jesus gives us, or Matthew gives us a list of those helpers. There was Simon, AKA Peter. <laughs> Matthew was there too, he was a tax collector. <laughs> there was Judas Iscariot also, you remember him, he was the one who betrayed Jesus. Matthew also mentions Thomas, it seems to go without saying what we remember <laughs> him for. So you see, there's a lot of help. <laughs> it's interesting that Matthew doesn't simply name off the 12 apostles. That's all he really needs to do to make his point. But no, he had to comment on several of them. I'd say he was leading his readers just a bit. What we end up with is a list of particular helpers with questionable ethics. <laughs> Matthew doesn't exactly give us the A-team when he adds such commentary about the apostles. I feel somewhat less comforted. Mm -hmm. If these questionable few 
presented as our benchmarks for discipleship aren't concerning enough, Matthew also gives them job descriptions. We have the veritable laundry list of responsibilities that includes no less than proclaiming the good news, curing the sick, raising the dead, cleansing the lepers, and casting out demons. You know, just the usual stuff. <laughs> the work we have before us today to build community doesn't look as difficult as that if we're being honest with ourselves. When I compare Matthew's list of responsibilities and the quality of the standard bearers of our faith with today's ministry field, I can almost hear the wisdom of my old man when he used to say, I'll give you something to cry about. <laughs> we don't hear a lot about leper cleansing these days. Nevertheless, there is still much work to do. Just when we may find ourselves beginning to tense up over all of this, Jesus, thankfully, steps back in with his trademark compassion and love. Jesus tells us the most important thing. Don't panic. Worry not about what you think you don't have and what you think you can't do. Jesus says, take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey, or two tunics or sandals or a staff. These things we convince ourselves we need in order to do the job may just end up getting in the way. In a world that craves more and more, more things, more equipment, more supplies, working with fewer things feels counterintuitive. The powers of mass marketing would have us believe that to be effective, we must equip ourselves with goods that will ensure our success. But there's an art to living with only what's actually needed. Minimalist lifestyles are chic and sometimes exotic, but minimalist approaches help us to focus on what the actual priorities are. The good news of Jesus is all about gathering the beloved community. It's about people, not about stuff. When it comes to being equipped for ministry, we can be sure that God has already given us all the tools and equipment we need to do the job well. Those first disciples had significantly less material goods that we have than we have today, and yet look at what they accomplished. Jesus traveled all over the countryside with his friends with no evidence of a second tunic or a staff and yet he had everything he needed. He and the apostles had what they needed because the communities of people surrounding them applied their skills and resources to support them on their journey. And in the process, they discovered the good news of the living God amongst their own selves. I'd say Jesus and Peter and Judas and Thomas and Matthew were all pretty effective at their ministry and inviting others to share the work in the field. The aim of Jesus and his conqueror, Matthew, is to show that we're already equipped to do the ministries we're called to do. The abundance of the harvest is meant to overwhelm us with the gifts and grace of God, not the burden of discipleship. We have enough, and we are enough. Lamenting what we think we don't have or think we can't do distracts us from the task at hand. The task at hand is this, to build up the beloved community of God. Gather in the outsiders. Gather in the people that are not here in the empty spaces in these pews. Gather them in and give them a place of community. Care for the vulnerable, so that they learn to value themselves. Empower others to use the gifts that God has given them because they too already have everything they need to help their neighbors. And ground the harvest work in love and compassion the way Jesus taught us. 
Jesus was able to see beyond the shortcomings and character flaws in the apostles. Matthew highlights them, of course, and in doing so, in the context of the field of harvest, it casts doubt on the effectiveness of these apostles. What's important for us is not Matthew's presentation of the pericope, but the presence of Jesus in it. We know that Jesus knew what kind of people were gathered in those first followers. God was able to see beyond whatever shortcomings and character flaws the apostles had. The question for us is, can we see beyond them? Jesus says the harvest is plentiful. Back in Genesis, God saw the world that was created and declared it was good. What do you think it is that makes asking for more workers to bring in the harvest anything less than inviting others to share in the goodness of that abundance of God's creation? Jesus' trademark love and compassion shine through this reading when we see the work through those qualities. We are able to see beyond our own shortcomings and character flaws, and we can see beyond those things in others as well. Jesus can, God can, and we can. Can we invite others to share the abundance of God's creation? Not because there's not enough of us, but because there's far more than what we need. The beloved community is apparent when we gather together to see the world as Jesus saw it, to see our neighbors and ourselves as Jesus does. Matthew's presentation of this scene in the story of Jesus provides us with important context to understand ourselves in relation to the power of Jesus' love and compassion. My sisters and brothers and non-binary siblings in Christ, the harvest is indeed plentiful. So let's invite others to share in the abundance that we enjoy. There is plenty to go around. There always has been. And that's the good news. Amen.